And so the first thing I'm going to do is a simple and over. So I'm going to open this one, which is about mouse diet. This is an experiment where they had mice and they fed them on different uh, diets, so calorie restricted diets, to see if it uh, caused the mouse to live longer. So you had some on low protein. The general belief is that calorie restricted diets lead to longer lifetimes because the people who were starved during the Second World War and suffered any of the, some of the famines, those that survived have lived quite a long time afterwards. And so somebody did an experiment in mice to see if this is a, this is true. Now, if it was just between two diets, a normal diet and a low calorie diet, then you could do a t-test. But in this case, there are a variety of different diets. So there's NP, so your normal one, there's N, N85, there's low pro, there's NR50, there's RR50, and there's NR40. So getting to lower calorie restrictions for your mouse. So what do you want to know is, are they living longer? So you've got only one variable you're measuring for each of the different groups, which is important, which is their lifetime. Um, not sure what that's, whether it's in days or weeks. It can't be days, they live longer than that, so it must be weeks. You want a fairly uh, limited lifespan animal if you're going to do one of these because you don't want to be there 100 years later still waiting to finish collecting your data. Turtles would not be a good idea, giant turtle. Right, so analyze. I want to do exactly the same as before. So I want to compare the means, but not between two groups. I want to do it between multiple. So that's an example of a one-way ANOVA. It's called an ANOVA because it compares the variance of pooling all the stuff together compared to the variances of each of the se groups separately. So if the variance change when, changes when you pool all the data together, then you've got data with different mean values. So the variance becomes much wider. That's all you're doing and you do something called an F-test. F for Fisher, but it's all in the lecture notes and videos. So to do this, I've only got one dependent variable and I've got one factor. Now, SPSS has got really fussy about this. So the factor, if I view it as value labels, has to be numeric. I can have any kind of character label for it I like, but it has to be numeric. If you don't have it, coded to numeric, it won't allow you to put it in here. So I could just run that now. Actually, I'm sorry, I just press the run now. So it runs it and it does that. So it tells you the F statistic is 57.104 and the significance is zero. So there's a difference between the groups. Now, this is why I'm not overly excited by the F test. And I can imagine what F stands for that it does stand for Fisher, because this has told me absolutely nothing other than there's a difference between the groups. Yeah, and difference between which groups? All of them, some of them, one of them? I don't know. Now I could have done a graph before I started doing this kind of thing. So I could have drawn a box plot, put in a box plot, put lifetime on the uh, y-axis, diet on the x-axis, pressed OK. And this would show me whether there's a difference between the different groups. So here's the normal lifetime of the mice. And then as you restrict the calories, it goes up. So yes, there's a difference. In and over, if there's no difference, I could draw a horizontal line between the means of each of the different groups. If there's a difference, then you 
get some deviation from a horizontal line. That's what one way and over is doing for you. So it's a composite of t tests and regression. One way and over combines the two different properties. So this plot is a nice useful thing telling me what the actual differences are that are significant. So between the normal one and all the other diets really, uh, the N, N85 is not particularly great and does overlap with normal, but these four are going to be significantly different to the normal. Can I do a test to show that's true? Well, I could do a pairwise t-test. So I could do a test between NP and RR50. I could just pick that one to do and do a test and it'll show it's significantly different. That's fine. But if someone says, well, have you checked all the other groups? So then you systematically have to do each group against each other. So one against two, three, four, five, six, two against three, four, five, six, three against four, five, six, four against five, six, and five against six. You have to do all those tests. Now, a problem when you do tests is each time you're picking a chance of 0.05, so one in 20 of finding a significant result when it's not there. That's what your p-value cutoff means. So if I do one test, that's fine. Probability is 0.05, getting it wrong. But if I do two tests, then those probabilities add together. Now the probability is 0.05 for each test, but added together is 0.1. So I can keep doing that. And eventually, if I do 20 tests, then on average, I will find one spurious incorrect result. It's not never a certainty because of the binomial and the way that works, but I can get fairly large probabilities of me getting a wrong answer when there's no difference and I'm seeing one. So we have to do what is called corrections to deal with multiple testing. So what I should have done when I was doing the compare the means is not just run that straight test straight away. I should have uh, clicked on something which is called post hoc. So post hoc means after the event. So after you found out that there's a significant difference between your five groups, what do you want to do? So you want to do pairwise t-tests between all of the different groups and you need to do a correction. So the correction you can use is any of these. There's lots of different ones. So LSD sounds promising. Bonferroni, Sidax, Shifa, I don't know what Reg WF and Reg WQ are. SNK, two keys, Hoshberg, and so on. Now there's equal variance is assumed or an equal variance is not assumed. So you could do these corrections as well, depending on what you think is happening in your data. The basic one that you have to be familiar with is Bonferroni. So what it does is if you're doing two tests, is it divides the P that you're going to get across the two tests. So instead of your threshold being 0.05, it is now 0.025. And SPSS automatically corrects these kind of things and gives you the correct threshold. So in the table, you can still see if it's significant or not, because is that value below 0.05? Uh, other commonly used ones are Sidek and Shifa. Shifa wrote the textbook on ANOVA, so he should know what he's doing. Two keys was a very important statistician, and I think that's one of the simplest of all the methods. But right, you can click on the three different methods and do continue. And then you can go OK. So this has done all of the different comparisons for Shifa, Bonferroni, and Sidak. Now, what you need to do here is look down the SIG column to see which ones are significantly different. So in this case, they're all significantly different to NP, which is the normal diet. They're also all significant difference, significantly different to the N N85 diet. 
But once you get to the low pro and the calorie restricted ones, they're different to the first two, but they're not different to the two in the middle. And it is actually different to the very extreme uh, restricted calorie diet. Then the N50 is not different to any of the restricted diets, but is to the first two and so on. Now, if you look at the numbers on Schieffer and you look at the numbers on Bonferroni, they're going to be different to each other. Which one's best? It's up to you. Bonferroni is the default that I would suggest that you use. It is a bit what we call overly conservative. So it's likely to not find a difference when there is one. So generally the p-values tend to be a little bit bigger on uh, Bonferroni than they are on the others. Apart from here, you've got a higher one in Schieffer. Always the exception to prove the rule. If your particular discipline and the papers you've read where you're extending that work use a particular uh, correction, then use that particular correction. Now, how many tests are we doing here? We're doing one, two, so I'm doing Five plus four plus three plus two plus one. So I'm doing 15 tests. So I have to divide that 0.05 by 15 to get the thresholds. If these were not showing out to be massively significant here, and they are showing to be massively significant here, then what I could do is take another approach. What I could do is on the analysis and compare means, I could use these things which are called contrasts. So a contrast allows you to compare one particular group to the others and therefore reduce the number of tests you do. So if I compare the normal diet as my control just to all of the other uh, diets, then I'm doing five tests instead of 15. So I don't need to do so much correction. Um, this is a bit of a pain to set up. So the way you would do it is you'd say the first column of data, the first, sorry, the first subgroup, I wish to do five tests with it. Then the next subgroup, I want to do one test because I'm doing, oops, I want to do one test and I want to do it against that first subgroup. So you put it at minus one. Next one, you'd also add as minus one. The next one you'd add as minus one. And the next group you'd add as minus one. One, two, three, four. And the next one would be minus one. The total of the coefficients should always be zero. And fingers crossed I can go continue and I can go OK. So when it's done the contrasts, it's calculated the differences between the MP group and all the others. It's done that single uh, test here and it's given you the p-value. So it's saying that there's a very significant difference and you can do this for equal or unequal variances. So you probably want to use the unequal variances one, the bottom row. So that allows you to cut down the amount of tests. So if you did post hoc like this and you got something that was 0.06, so tenfold larger than this, so it's not below the 0.05 cutoff, then it could be just because your bond for only correction or Schieffer correction is being too conservative. So if you change it to using contrasts, you might find that it's a significant result, whereas it's not significant if you just throw all the tests in. Now you can figure out which contrast you want to do by doing the bar chart. Uh, not bar chart, box plot. I hate bar chart, never do bar chart. By doing the box plot. So you can look at the box plot and go, woo, these are different. And that will dictate which one of the, how you use your contrast and which groups you test against which others. Also, the design of ex the experiment can dictate what your contrast should be. So if you've picked out one group as reference 
and you want to compare all the other groups to that reference, then you should be using contrast. You should not be indiscriminately comparing everything to everything else. 